test, test. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, maybe just a bit. Like test, test, test. Okay, so we are back to we're back to the Saga GUI. Uh, so what we did in the morning, I told you a bit about the uh, Saga GS, the 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 people behind it and how it's developed and um, the versions in last uh, ten years or something, uh, and how it went from having like fifty modules to over five hundred modules. Uh, so now we are uh, we have the we downloaded Saga JS and we installed it and we installed it so we can get the GUI and we can also access it from from R. So if first block first block is finished once you if you do if you start your R session if you do R Saga dot env the Saga environment and if you get if you get a, a, a good connection. Uh, with the, um, well, the main thing is the Saga CMD, which is a shortcut for Saga command line. Um, so if you get that, and if you can open a Saga GUI, then the first block is uh, successfully finished. Now we'll first look at the Saga GUI, and then we'll start slowly going from uh, Saga GUI switching to using a, um, um, R to do things. So first thing with the Saga GUI, I, I mean, I can if you start your Saga GUI, you might see something different that I see, and I see that now my uh, two of the main uh, um, window environments they are on the same side. So what I can do, I can drag and drop. So I just drag it, and I can drop it either up. So I I could also put it somewhere here. Uh, it's not a nice place where I want to have it, so I want to put it on the on the right side. Okay? And I can also increase here the window size, so I can customize it a bit so it's easier to use. So this one can be a bit smaller. And then the other thing I showed you, if I select the uh, tools libraries, I can turn off the beep when finished. So I turn it off. I don't want to hear that. And I have to do apply. If you don't do apply and if you switch to something else, then it's not going to save. So you have to do apply. Uh, yeah, so you have to click exactly on the tools library, so on the on the root of the tools. You have to you have to click on it, so then it selects it. You see, when I'm here, then it's not visible, but when I'm here, it becomes visible. Uh, so there's lots of stuff actually looks a bit hidden in Saga JS, but that's why we're doing this course. I want to show you where the things are. Uh, the same thing if I go to data. I can say, um, for example, here you, you see there's a settings uh, to, so there's something like settings in R Studio. So it says automatically save and load. So if I have like 10 layers open and I want to uh, close the Saga JS, but when I start the Saga JS, I want the same layers to uh, open, then, then you use this setting. You can also say uh, start uh, empty. So I, I will I will just change some things, but this is really a question of taste. For example, also to visualize um, to so Saga GS when it opens a raster image, it will try to calculate legend, and it calculates it by using two standard deviations. So it doesn't use min and max like what you will get in ArcGIS. Maybe it uses the standard deviation by default. Uh, so that's you can also uh, you can like in Saga JS like in R you can have a, a temporary file being saved somewhere. Now it's probably just saved in a, some temporary folder under Windows, 
on the Linux, but you can also say I want to save the temporary file inside some working directory. I want to see that temporary file. So that's also possible. So there's lots of things you can do you can do here. And then on the maps I showed you, I went and turned off the scale bar. So I just turned it off. So th but that's, again, that's a question of taste and you know, you can customize, uh, you can customize Saga just the way you want it. So that's up to you when you use it. Now let's just try this. So now I can go and say, okay, I'm happy with this. And I, I exit the Saga JS, and then I restart it again. I just want to check if if um, all my settings are saved. You get every time you start Saga JS, you get some tip windows, tips windows. So that's up to you if you want to use. And so you see all, all my things are saved the way I left it last time. So that's nice. Hey. Okay, now we want to put some we want to put some data in the Saga GS and we want to use the data that we're going to use for the exercise for the uh, afternoon. Um, so, but the data comes in an R package. The data is in the R package, so we have to do a few steps to get from R package to Saga GS. So, if you follow me now, you will see it's not it's nothing too difficult, but you have to follow me and then so we're going to get the data. So I'm going back to the R studio. Uh, you can also f you can also this code if you if you get lost the code is in my slides. So if you look at the So here is that code. So that's what we have to run to get the data. So we have to load the package, plot KML, and then we load the data. So I do library. And by the way, I will just start, because it's much easier, I will just start doing everything um, in a script. So I say library plot KML. So this is a, it's called a Baranya Hill data set. It's a four by four kilometer uh, block. And this data set we actually used in our book. Uh, it's just called geomorphometry. So we use one data set to do all different processing, different software. And uh, so it's a very educational data set. And uh, you can see here that there, there's the, there's a grid data set and there's the X, Y, Z. X, Y, Z is obviously uh, X, Y, and uh, elevations, and but there's also the um, there's also the grid data set. So I'll just copy all these things here for you. So we'll start from here. It has a specific projection system also. So are you able to find this documentation? 
So I don't do any script. What I do, I all the exercises we do today, they come in a in a package. So they are, we'll just do the package uh, sample scripts, and we'll just start slowly, and then we'll go into the bit more complicated. So there's not much of code, not so much code, uh, but I will go slower so you can you can catch catch up with things. So there's no R script. I don't share the R script. You use the code examples. So if you run here, this one. So if you run this line, the question mark, B, A, R, X, Y, Z. So Baranya Hill. So if you do, if you run that, then you get this documentation. And then on the bottom of the documentation, you have all this code. This is the code we're going to run today. You see it uses, it uses R and it uses uh, Saga GS. And so it's all combined. See that, we just want to run this today, that's it. <laughs> but it's complicated, so, and I'm doing it very gentle, so we, I want you, I want you to develop a skill. I don't want, I don't just want to show you like everything you can do with our saga. So I want you to develop a skill, so I think it's more educational to take a smaller chunk, but then go line by line and discuss it and see, okay, what's going on here? Because if you learn how to use one thing, you will figure out how to do all the, 570 modules, so it's not going to be difficult after that. It shouldn't be, at least. Okay, so you can you can just select this code, right, and you put it in your own script. If it's easier for you, you have to customize. Look, you have to customize this um, layout of um, R Studio. So under Tools, Global Options, you have this uh, layout. And if you want to get the same layout as me, then you have to put the console on the top left, source on the right, and then you leave these two things below. Then you can get the same console as me. And I also have to turn on uh, wrapping. Yeah, I need to c turn on the wrapping. So I turn on the wrapping and I you can also see my active line is now uh, highlighted. Yes? yes? Okay, so you don't get this thing. Do you get? Okay, so you have to do install packages. Okay. So you have a problem with the plot KML. Let's see. Here I, I did install it somewhere. I did that. Yeah. So if you show me the. Um, then I, I try to load it and I don't know. Uh, it, I think it has a problem with the pass, but normally it does not install in this pass. Okay. So no, what you have to do, I see it here, plot KML, yeah. but it doesn't. Uh, you loaded it from here, right? So just try to do. Uh, oh, yeah, do this one. Yeah, try to uh, restart your R Studio. Okay. Because I don't know where where does it put it. It's somewhere else. On it's weird because it looks for it here where it should be. Yeah. But it's somehow that it's here. I don't know. The other packages are. Yeah, yeah. There. That's because you get your packages installed on different folder because you're not administrator on your laptop. I think. Yes, Okay, try to restart your R Studio, and then let's see. So save the image and try to restart. Let's see. Uh, anybody else has a problem with the loading plot KML? When you when you load plot KML, you get the version. And you um, you can see the home page of the plot KML where there's all the um, gallery of visualizations and things. Okay, so uh, so I can load this data, and when I load it, you see it's just a it's just a table. When I look at the structure, it's just a table with uh, six thousand three hundred seventy points, and I have the XY coordinates and the elevation. 
So it's a simple point data set with elevations. They are really precisely located elevations for that area. And I can load the, I can, I can define the coordinate system. It's a bit longer. It's also actually, it's good to work to see that the, some coordinate system, they can have a really long proj4 string. Um, so they are, uh, in this case, the coordinate system has this uh, VGS84 shift, which is a seven parameter shift. So that's why it's a bit longer. So, but it's, it's good to see that. Then we say, okay, attach coordinates, except I need now, I need to have my library SP. So I add library SP, run that. And I can attach coordinates and now I get the spatial points data frame. And I can attach the coordinate system. And I can do now also library RGDAL that allows me to read and write spatial data. And I can say write OGR. And now I write it to external file. a bit long, you have to do a bit of typing. And so when I do this, so now it went and created a shape file. So I use that shape file. Okay, so now I will, I will wait now for you because now we can open that in Saga GS. So I started from table, table data. I created a point data set. I attached the coordinate system and then I wrote that spatial layer. I wrote it using RGDAL. I wrote it to SR shape file. And Saga GS works with, uh, it also has a GDAL support. So you can also drag and drop any uh, GDAL supported layer. But uh, Saga GS has its own raster format, and for the vector data, you can use shape files. That's kind of a most common question. Um, uh, yeah, I uh, put the dot because uh, when you put the dot, it means copy the. Uh, so when you do a write or GR, you have to define the name of the f ex exit file. And you also have to write the name of the layer. And when you put a dot, then it will try to guess the layer, which means it takes it from the file name. But that's something with the OGR because you have the f a file can have a multiple layers. And uh, I, don't, I don't play too much with that. So what I do, I just say, okay, use the, use the default. And putting a dot there, it means I use a guess the layer name. It will be same as if I will write just just the name of the shape file without the extension. So it does the same thing. I do have to say, you have to say that's unfortunate. I mean, you can test that. Um, so let me save this first. So I'll call this um, bar saga. I do have to clean up a bit. I see I'm getting lots of this exit file. Well, this can stay, it can stay. Um, so if I just try to do this, I, do, I actually, to tell you honestly, I don't like it that this one is not working because if you say the extension that then RGDAL should guess, you know, if I say dot uh, SHP, then the uh, RGDAL should guess, okay, you want the SF shape file, but it doesn't work. So that's a, it's, a, it's unfortunate, but so you have to do, you have to have, you have to define the layer and you have to define the, which type of uh, vector data they want to write. Question? Hi, 
Okay, so the question is to um, summarize the RGDAL basically. So RGDAL is a, uh, so it's a R library for uh, GDAL, and GDAL is an abbreviation for Geospatial Data Abstraction Library. And basically it's a translation library uh, for vector and for raster data. So vector data is like point lines or polygons, and raster data it's yeah, like images. And so the, um, a really nice person from Canada made a, a translation library. He did it professionally first, but then he released it into open source. His name is Frank Wardendammer. And he released it to open source, and that allows you to translate from different formats. But there's also, he also implemented lots of functionality, which we call GDAL utilities, and they allow you to do different processing. Uh, so then uh, Roger Bivan, he compiled the GDAL, which was a standalone library. He compiled it for the R, and he made a package called RGDAL. And this package RGDAL allows you to go from R objects to uh, GIS uh, formats. One of the most common, actually the, probably the most common vector data format is uh, ESRI shapefile. ESRI is the GIS company from California, right? And so they made the specification of this uh, shapefile. And this is also the format which is used in Saga GS for vector data. So if you want to get the vector data to Saga GS, you have to get it to the ESRI shapefile. OK, did you all manage to get to this point to do a write OGR? OK, wait a bit. You get an error? Ah, okay, it's a typo. You put RZ. You have to put S3. There's lots of times it happens in R that you do a typo. Um, and you don't see it. It's, you know, it yeah, it can be, it's, it's, it's human. I mean, it's not, nobody, nobody's to blame. But then, uh, so usually what it means is you, you're probably at the end of the day, you're getting tired and you should uh, relax a bit, take, get some fresh air and, then you come back and say, oh, oh, I did that mistake. Oh, silly for me. But uh, it's, it's, it's no problem. It's a, it's a human human thing to... Um, you still get even with the Esri? Let's see. Maybe there's another with the similar. Uh, yeah, okay. So this is not... Again, it's a typo, but it, it's really nitty-gritty. So the S, S is capital. S is capital. <laughs> Very sorry about that. Uh, these driver names, by the way, these this names here, the, uh, because we said R is uh, case sensitive, and also uh, it will be case sensitive here, and you can look at the list of all the drivers, exactly the names, so you can just also copy-paste when you say OGR drivers. And so then you can see these are the exact names. So all these things can be uh, worked with uh, using the RGDAL. So if I search for ESRI, so you see there are several ESRI formats. But you see here also there's a capital S. None, not all of these drivers you can use from RG. So if you make an object in R and you say now I want to put it in a, a external format, uh, not uh, with RGDAL, you cannot uh, create um, all of these drivers. For example, if you look at the ESRI, uh, you cannot create a personal geodatabase. So creation is no. You can read it, but you cannot create it. If you look on the top of the table, you see there's a creation. And there's the, well, there's the creation georeferencing, not reading. But so it says, um, personal geodatabase, you cannot create. Why, why is that? What do you think? Why cannot we create it with the RG though? Any ideas? So 
So how come we cannot, you know, some formats we can create, the other formats we cannot. Why is that? Uh, well, I'm, I'm also, I'm actually, I don't know the exact details. I, I don't know the details, but uh, my assumption is that uh, many of the software, it's commercialized, and they also, uh, they, the way to protect software is to protect the format, so they don't give all the details. It's like, I don't give you the whole recipe. And because imagine if I could create this type of files, I don't need Esri software anymore. I could just use R and create... Um, you know, Esri uh, files without using their software, and so that wouldn't be good for their business. So, so that's why uh, uh, software also, software companies they do keep some of the code closed, and and you so you don't have the exact recipe. You don't know how to exactly to produce. So the only way to work with the data is to buy the software from them. Okay, if if this thing all went. Uh, right, so the right OGR, so you should have in your working folder, so if I look in the, uh, so my working folder is uh, R, the D R course, and so if I look here in my working folder, I can see that I have this uh, shape file, which is got just called B A R X Y Z. And I can also look at this, look at this uh, shape file here. You see, there's no icon attached to the shape file. So if I double click on the shape file, uh, it will say, "Okay, what do you do? What do you want to do with this file?" Because there's no attachment to this uh, data format. But what I can do, I can I can uh, drag and drop that shape file. So just the shape file, I can drag and drop it into the data, so into the data window, and you will see that I have it now as a point data set. Okay, so let's try to do that. And you can see that the, so in, in 11.33, I loaded the shape file from D R course B A B A R X Y Z dot shape. And if you want to see, of course, if I switch to maps or if I switch to tools, then I won't see the data. I have to be in the data. Um, um, date this uh, the the manager window, so you have to activate the the data. Uh, window and you see now if I do on thumbnails I can see that there's some as a thumbnail showing the point date because there's lots of points so it's difficult to see them okay uh, you can do you can do here uh, open but once it, once you just drag and drop, it will say that it loads, loads the shape file. So, I think it's a synonym, really. It's, a, but here it's in the. If you go from a, if you do a point and click, then it's a open. I think is the word. Um, if I double click it, I get it. I can uh, visualize it. Okay. So there's a lots of points. You see the visualization is quite fast. And if I uh, select a window, it zooms in. If I right click, I can zoom out. And if I want to see the whole layer, then I click on this one, and so zoom on active layer. And I can also zoom on all layers. This, in this case, there's no difference because I only have one layer. So there's really no difference. And then I can say, I can, once this, so this layer is now, I have to select it, so I make it active. Now, this is called active layer in R, it means, so I, I selected it, so I can play with its properties. And for example, I can say, 
uh, put a um, color, uh, make a graduated graduated colors, and if I do this now, I get this nice colors. I can see how the values change, going from 85 to 244. So these are elevations from 85 to 244. Okay. Yeah, just to just to do it for comparison, I will. I can also plot. I can do SP plot. SP plot on the. Uh, we'll plot the first layer or something. Well, there's only one layer, so I can just do without this just to show you for comparison. It's also quite fast in R, but you know, it's much more difficult to you know, play with this here to zoom in and customize it. So I don't really use R so much to visual and explore uh, geographical data. Okay, we want to get one more layer. This was a one this was a vector layer. We want to get one more layer uh, into, into Saga.js so we can load the second layer, which is the um, BRR grid. Okay, so I can load this. And this one is a, a bit, this is a bit more values because now it's a grid, so that's 15,000 values. And I can attach uh, coordinates, and I say this is gridded. And then I can copy coordinate system. And now I do, uh, I don't do write OGR, I do write GDAL. And again, say the, uh, the external file name is um, now with extension S dot. So this is the Saga GS extension. Are you all able to find this code or should I uh, show you one more time what the code is? So the code is at the bottom of the description of the B A B A R X Y Z. So if you search B R X Y Z, then you get this Baranya Hill case study, and this is the the code you can see it here. That's the code we're going to run through the day, and we'll go step by step. There's lots of stuff here. Actually, that looks like a short code, and that, but that's the code that we're going to run today. So now I created this uh, gridded file. I can also visualize it. Let's try with the. So then I get this thing. You can see it's a spatial grid data frame. And we can write it, we can write it into a Saga.js format. Uh, I just have to say missing value flag. So I have to add, uh, 
the missing value flag because the Saga GS doesn't work with NA values and uh, it doesn't, unfortunately that's a, it's a bit of cumbersome so, uh, so I have to specify missing value flag as a numeric value because Saga GS actually works only with numeric bands. I cannot export something which is not numeric. By the way, this uh, driver for Saga GS, so that's what uh, Roger and me made uh, about four years ago. I was here in Bergen or five years ago, and we spent one week, and uh, well, Roger did most of the implementation, and, and on the end of the week, we had a driver for Saga GS. Before that, you have to write, you had to write from R to some GeoTIFF, and then from GeoTIFF, you had to import into Saga GS. So by this, we really solved it, so now if you do this, uh, you see, you get a you get a file. Oh, maybe I forgot something. Yeah, sorry, I forgot something. So you have to put the saga because now it made a geotiff with that extension. <laughs> so I have to do this, and and now it's the proper one. So I I had to say which is the driver. So once I wrote that into the directory, I can also... Now this one is recognized by Saga GS because it's a Saga grid, S-G-R-D, Saga grid. And so if I will double click it, ah, not good. It calls the new, it opens the new, so don't double click it. I made a mistake. Because it opens us another session of Saga GS. So a better thing to do is also to drag and drop. So you just carry it and then you drop it and now you have it here. Can you show me auto? Uh, sorry. Uh, I still use S dot as the extension. Yes, it's still S dot, but I didn't specify the driver. And if you do write GDAL, if you don't specify the driver, then it goes and picks up the default one, which is a GeoTIFF. But it's funny because you can make a, uh, you can put your own extension, uh, but it will make a GeoTIFF. So, yeah, it's a bit confusing. Uh, but I'm not responsible for our GDAL. That's, uh, that's what the Roger does. And so if you have some things about our GDAL that you think it should be different, then you, can, you have to write to him because I cannot, I cannot change their things. And this uh, missing value flag you can do without it. I can show you when I do without it, but if I don't specify it's uh, minus five times nine, which is a default Saga missing value, then Saga will try to guess a missing value flag and this missing value flag might not be the one which is in the in the uh, written by the GDAL. So there's a mismatch there. So the only way to avoid that mismatch is to really use specified, and you specify it by using the default saga missing value, which is the uh, five times nine minus five times nine. Yes. One more time, your icon is? The reason why you don't have the uh, Saga icon on the uh, SGRD uh, file is because you didn't install Saga GS from EXE, because you just download it in, and uncompress it, so it's not registered uh, a format in your Windows. But that's not the problem. Um, so that this thing that you don't see the icon, so don't worry about it. But uh, if you if you drag and drop, you should be able to to get it here. If you don't get it, then we have a problem. Okay, so let me check with you. It's probably something when you did during the writing. 
Sorry? You okay. Oh yeah. Sometimes when you open, you can open some layer in Saga GIS, but then you are looking at the wrong window, and then it looks like there's nothing there. So, but uh, you will agree with me. I think the Saga GUI is really. Um, I think it's quite quite easy to uh, get used to and to find things. So the the only really catch is. Sometimes if you want to do, for example, I want to change some setting uh, on, the, on some layer, and until I make it active, I have to make it active. Otherwise, I cannot change things, and I have to do apply. So if you don't follow these small tricks, then you say, well, this doesn't work. So that's, again, that's the idea of this course, that I show you all the small tricks, so you find your way quickly, and then it, it's not a frustration. So you will see after some time, oh yeah, it makes sense. I activate the layer, then I change the settings. I cannot go to settings, I want to change settings with layer before I activate it. There's also the hidden things, like if I look now at this raster, and let's say we will put this raster on top of the same app. Now it's on the, on the top of the points. I have a raster layer. This is on top of the points. So that's not nice, right? I have the points and then I have the raster. I don't want it like that. I want raster to be the below the points. So then I go to the maps. And now how do I move this raster to put it below? Well, you can actually drag and drop also. But it looks like it doesn't work if I move it this way. Now it works. You, you can take the points and you drag and drop them on top. But you can also just, if you do a right click and you say move up or move to top, so you can, you can play with that. So you can reorganize the layers. You can also, uh, so I'm now in the map view, I can also say, well, I don't show the points. Just let's look at the rasters now. So the, the points are here but don't show them. And you see now they're put in the brackets. So I can say show or don't show. Is that a Linux? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I don't know if it's some, um, so it must be that it's uh, the, it must be your Saga, Saga GUI in, in Linux that it has to read, I, will, I don't know if things are remote or if you have some, if, you, if it asks for some checks for permission or something. Okay, anyway, we're looking now at this uh, grid. I'll go back to that grid in the data view and you see that you can quickly get, so this is a grid, a container uh, and it has only one grid, and but it shows the properties. So there's a 30 meter resolution, 123 by 124. So 123 columns by 124 rows, and these are the coordinates of the begin. So it, it, it's a basic grid definition. Okay, and it says there's only one layer. Now if I go, if I select that layer, and I can so say show cell values. show cell values. Then don't forget I have to say apply. And now if I zoom in somewhere, I can see actual values in the pixel. So that's very nice. So when I, when I take the, the pan window, I can see the actual values. So that's quite I like, that's why I like to use Saga GS. When I do geostatistics or some analysis, I eventually I want to see the exact numbers. And you can, you can also zoom in into a big raster, no problem. And you can zoom in into pixels 
and you can see the actual number. So you can do lots of validation. Uh, so there's few options to zoom zoom out. So uh, left click is the zoom in, of course, um, and then the right click is the zoom out. But you can finish somewhere, and then you can say, well, I just want to zoom to this layer, and you get the whole layer. There's also the pan button, so I can move the map left to right. Sorry. Yes, the cell values will only be displayed, of course, otherwise it wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able to see anything. They will only be displayed if, you're, uh, if you have, I think, uh, it's 200 pixels on the, on the width or something like that. So they, they will only do it once you're uh, at some level where it can be displayed. If it can be displayed, then it's obviously impractical to try to upload them. Funnily enough, if you work with the point data, so I'm going back now to the maps view, and I can turn on the can turn on the points, and for the points I can also uh, put the uh, the z values. And in this case, it will be big mess because it will really put all the numbers. So it puts uh, numbers next to the points. So and, and that becomes a bit messy because it's just, so maybe don't even try this because it uh, becomes really messy. So then I have to say none and I move that. Uh, for, this, for this grid, I mean, I, I now have the same uh, legends. So I will again turn off this layer and I have the same kind of legends for both the elevations and this a grid I exported. This grid, by the way, do you know what it is? It's a percentage of pixels with uh, water inside. So it's a percentage. So it's from zero to one. One is 100%, zero is zero percent. So it's a percentage of water coverage within the pixel. So what we want to do in this exercise, we want to go from the point data, create a DEM, and then from the DEM, we calculate the stream network, and then we compare the stream network to the actual density of, of uh, water, the, the, the actual stream network. So this, this uh, uh, percentage of pixels with water it's been derived from like a land survey so, and from aerial photographs, so it's a highly accurate. So if you have a model and you build up a hydrological model, then you can validate how accurate is the, so how accurate is the hydrological model compared to the actual uh, water. Water streams. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand. So if you, you're asking if, if you want to find out more about this data set or? Yes, if I can uh, yes. try it. Uh, I think the attributes kept in the table that I can uh, You like a, like a metadata, you yes, mean? Yes, um, No, that will be more difficult to, to do, get it, to send it from uh, right GDAL. It's more difficult. Um, so if I look at this grid, there is the information information page, and it, it does sh show me, for example, that it says undefined coordinate system. So you see that there are some th things are lost. It, it shows me only that there's a one band and the cell size, and the, um, so it's a 3.6 by 3.6 kilometer. So it shows me just some general info that, that's generated by, by Saga GIS, but not the, not the met real metadata, uh, so 
uh, it does only also show me the history, which means, okay, you just loaded it from the, from the file. But yes, yeah, some things will be, will be lost. Uh, look at this thing. I can also, if I zoom in somewhere, and uh, I can just select group of pixels, so I can do this. And now there's like a three by three pixel selected, and I can see also these values of pixels in a table format. That's also quite nice. I think if I if I uh, keep on selecting bigger and bigger, eventually Saga just will complain. Will say, "Look, you're selecting too many pixels. I cannot work with this." So did you see this with this arrow? This is an action button in Saga.js, so this allows you to do lots of, lots of things. Um, and it's also the button that is used to digitize, so if you work with shape files, you can uh, digitize things. So that's called an action button. If you want to crop, or if you want to subset, if you want to just take one polygon and uh, save it separate, then you use the action button. So that's this arrow. This one here, that's the, you see it says here, action. Okay, now we had these points. So we have a grid and we have the points. And we can now go and make a uh, digital elevation model. And so we look at the groups of modules, which is called um, terrain analysis. Oh, sorry, no, first we create the digital elevation model, so we look at the um, we go from, from points to a grid. So we will take the points and we can use, for example, um, B spline approximation. So we are going to generate now from a point data, we want to generate a digital relation model and we can use the B spline approximation. It's under the geoprocessing, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what we're doing now, we're, we're visually using all these libraries, and then in the afternoon, we'll j be just doing the same thing, just with the code, so. And you, you will see what are the advantages. I do, I do use a GUI still, I mean, don't get me wrong. I do, when I, they make something new in Saga.js, or uh, I'm not sure what's going on, then I, I want to customize my, uh, accustom myself uh, to a new function, and then I use a GUI, and then I open, and I, I, I zoom in, and I see what's going on, I test it, and I say, okay, now I understand, but then I don't use the GUI after that anymore, then I go and make the code, because then I have to run it, you know, with the hundreds of files, or, um, or I have to run it on a server, or I have to run it remotely, so then I don't need a GUI anymore, I know what it does, I just want to now compute with it. Okay, did you try to run the these plines? So I have to select my points. You see, I told you it's a, it's a very uh, straightforward uh, for most of the, uh, so there are, there are some interactive modules and then it's a bit more complicated because you will activate it, then you have to do things and then you close. But if it's a not interactive module, then it's always it's the same, it's straightforward. You have the inputs, you have the parameters, you have the outputs. And it's the same thing that you have in R. Right, you have a function, you have a object that you go, that has an output, and you have the inputs and you have the settings. So it's the same thing. So here I say, I want the attribute Z, which is the elevation, and I want to uh, map it into uh, existing grid. I'm I'm not sure. I'm not getting any information about the. So let's try to put 30 meters because that's the one we have here. Let's see. Okay. Uh -huh. And now ask me which grid do we want? And I said, I want this one. So I want to create a new layer in an existing grid. And then I say, okay. And now I get that layer.
Yep, question? You were the first, come on. No, I, I think I missed uh, the steps. You missed a few steps. Okay, I'll, I'll do it one more time. I'll just open for the ones that, that maybe made it. Uh, so I'll just open this, so let's see. I open it in a new window and I get something like this. Hmm. It doesn't look so nice. It fitted kind of a spline all around, so. Well, we'll, we'll try something else. So that, that went, it was a very fast interpolation but I kind of don't like it. I don't buy that that's the type of DM we want to use. So we can try something else. So I go to geoprocessing and I say grid, uh, gridding, interpolation from points. Oh, we want spline, so yeah. So I go to spline. So let's try to do thin plate, thin plate spline. We can do a global or local. Let's try local, local should be faster. Let's try to do that. Now there's a bit more settings here. Huh? So I have to specify, um, again I say I want to, to have the grid which exists, but I have to specify now the search radius, maximum number of nearest points. You see, I have to specify things. This is a bit more uh, um, sophisticated method. So this is a localized thin plate spline. I'm not going to go into theory how it works. So there's uh, lots of literature on that, but that's actually one of the very um, um, common methods used to create DMs from, from point data. So thin plate spline, because it tries to fit like smooth surfaces and uh, assumption is that this, the surface topography is often very smooth due to erosion processes and everything. So it, it, it kind of very often when you start with the point data, you do get these smooth surfaces and it tries to like locally adjust these smooth shapes around. So it doesn't have any, for example, breaks or something. If I would just do a linear interpolation from points, then the points will be like spiky, but the, you know that topography doesn't look that. You know that topography is kind of smoothed out because of the all the erosion and all the effects due to wind and whatever. Okay, so that's that's kind of a common common method. So let's try to do thin plate spline. And again, I say create a new layer. Now this takes a bit more time, a bit more time. This took about um, let's say two seconds. And if I visualize this output, ah, much better. Very happy. Okay. No, I, I entered 30 meters, but you don't, uh, I didn't have to, uh, because uh, once you say that you want the existing grid, so you can say uh, create a grid out of blank, and SagaGS will try to guess the grid for you. Uh, but in this case, we have a grid, so we just want to create a new layer in an existing grid. So we go from point data to a, a new layer in an existing grid. So then we just have to pick up that grid from the pick list, and then Saga will try to match that points to that grid. Okay. Did you all manage to get a nice DM? Uh, we can do a quick check on that DM. This is where the Saga becomes quite uh, funky, uh, because I can do now 3D visualization of this. So I can say, okay, this is the grid I'm working in, that's where the elevations are, and show me. Now we are in a, in a 3D view. I don't see much topography, so I have to exaggerate it a bit. And so I have to press a lot of times, looks like, until I will get some topography. So maybe even better thing to do is to go to these 3D settings. And when I look at the exaggeration, let's see, exaggeration, and I can put 200. 
it's still quite small. Oh, I selected the wrong layer, sorry. <laughs> it's my mistake. One more time. So I go to the 3D and I say this one and this thing. So then I don't have to exaggerate. So this this will be okay. So here's the here's the elevation model. And now if I exaggerate I get this thing. Yeah, it you go very quickly, right? You go very quickly. Now this uh, topography is difficult to see actually. I don't see much here. So let's do some, um, which, let's make a new layer. So we go to the terrain analysis and we say lightning, analytical hill shading. Now remember you have to pick up this uh, thin plate spline and I use the standard settings. So I get uh, the analytical hill shading and now in the settings here I say uh, set up transparency, let's say 60% transparent and use the black to white, so that's okay. And so I can put now this layer on top of this layer. And so now when I look at the, in the 3D display, I not only see the topography, but I can see, I can see the um, shading. So this gives me really effect of landscape. Okay. So, so one more time. Okay, that's also a very nice thing. I'm tur I, I turn off now everything so it's easier to see. Very nice thing about Saga.js, everything you do, it's uh, saved in the history here. So I can go, if you, if you want to rerun something, you just go to your history. In this case, I have a history which does an easy sh shading. You don't have it. So I'm going to do the hill shading from the scratch. So I go to the geoprocessing. Uh, lightning and I say analytical hill shading. You see there's many other things I can do. I can do sky view factor, incoming solar radiation. Um, so there's lots of other things I can do. Okay, so if I go to hill shading, I have to select my uh, grid project, so the, the grid that I work with, and I have to select the elevation model we just created, which is the thin, plane, thin plate spline, local. And um, I create a new layer. Now I will re overwrite my layer. You, you will just have a create. And I use the standard settings. You can play with these settings. Settings are, um, well, here is a standard, but it can be also combined shading, ray tracing, uh, ambient. Uh, so you can you can play with these settings. So if you look, if you use the standard ones, you'll get the same display I have. So you get this thing. And, and then you go and say, well, I want to display this map on top of this map. Okay. And then you get this effect of of things being on top of each other. Then you get this thing. And you see this uh, thin plate spline, it does have some, some, something happens like here, there's some, mm, I'm not happy with this stuff. It's. Uh, and here also there's something happens. I can see why, why does this happen. So I can put the points on top. And then uh, zoom in where it happened. And what happens is the two points which are really close to each other. 
And so let's do like this. So now I'm, I'm doing some evaluation, what's going on here. So I say, show me the cell values. So I see the cell values. And I can say for the points, also put me the text. So you see, I have next to each other, I have uh, 185 and 189. And because these two points, it's kind of a, a geometrical, uh, how do you say, the ill-conditioned. So uh, you have a, a two points which have like a difference of uh, uh, four meters, but they're really close to each other. But all the other points are like much smoother differences. So something happens here. And that's why the, uh, the thin plate splines, they have a bit of problem there. Okay, so I can now interactively play with this thing. Look at this, this is very powerful now. So I can go and I say, recalculate my tilt plate spline, please. Um, maximum search distance, I will put 300. And maximum number of points, maybe I put a bit more. And I can also play with this regularization. I won't play with it now, I'll just leave it. But now I will get a different, I will get a different map. I will just replace, I replace the old map. And what happens is that my visualization should also change, except I didn't, I have to also recalculate my analytical heel shading. And now also my display changes a bit. It's just a slight change, so I didn't really manage to improve it much. But if you can believe me, it is a, the, the values are different. The different values. So you can you see you can play like that very quickly, and you can see live how the values change. I don't have to reopen the the maps. Oh yeah, look at this. I could do like also something like this. I could select this single point. This single point. Uh, okay, I have to make it active. Then I select it, and I think I can, if I right click on it, I can say edit selected shape, and let me see if I can just do delete. Now it looks like I can move it, but how do I delete it? I could change the value. Yeah, I can change the value to 186 and do apply. Now it's 186 and then I can go and uh, recompute again thin plate spline. Replace the file, and voila! Now it's uh, I turn off the editor, and if I zoom in, zoom out, sorry, you see that this problem is solved. So there was a one pixel higher, one pixel lower, so it's a problem solved. But okay, I'm doing now manipulation, which you know I'm not really thinking what I'm doing. I'm just showing you what how you can play with Saga GA. So you can do a kind of a live uh, fixing and editing. Right? It's nice. Uh, let me turn off these uh, points. There's too many points here. So I said, don't show. Um, And I can now do, and that's the stuff we will be doing in the afternoon. I can do some hydrological analysis and I can say, I'm oh sorry, ch uh, channels. And I say calculate me the channel network. Now there's a bit more settings here. I pick up my DM. And the rest I will just leave a, a default. 
maybe this put four. Uh, and I need some initiation grid. And I leave the same thing. And let's try. I'll go back to this on over a bit. So I'm running a bit faster. Uh, so now this thing calculated um, a flow network. And this is a flow network with one setting. Um, let me put this as a bit uh, thicker line. Um, why am I here? Yeah, so I put it a bit thicker so you can see. But you see there's a bit too many, too many channels. Uh, so I, I can change the setting. And I say, okay, make me channels which the minimum length is 20. And it goes and recomputes, and it will recompute it and replot it. You see? Very, very efficient. And I can now visually, let's take a look at this. And now we are looking at the 3D drape, and now we're looking how good are these uh, lines. I can increase the exaggeration. I can also increase the resolution, if I remember how to do that. Uh, so under this thing. Uh, I can increase the resolution to 600. And now I can see it much finer. And you see this uh, channel network looks okay, except few places it breaks. You know, it calculates the channel network here and then stops. And I kind of, mm, you know, it has this local sinks and computational in a GS world, I mean, you know that, okay, there is a sink, but it's uh, highly unlucky that the water will stop there because the water kind of breaks the sinks and continues flowing. Because if it's a small, small flow of water, okay, maybe it will accumulate somewhere. But the flow of water changes through time. It can be small flow or high flow. And as it changes through time, it will just find its way. The water finds its way. And the DM we made doesn't know about this. DM is, I mean, it's a, it's a mechanical thing we created. There's no, there's no, uh, we didn't develop this DM under assumption that is the water flows. We just used the thin plate splines. So we have to do some pre-processing. So in the terrain analysis, we can say, um, let's say this one I will run. Fill sinks. Um, yep. I'll come back to one. I'll run it one more time. I'll run it one more time. No worries. Um, so you see, I can here, I can say, uh, f uh, fill in this uh, sinks. So let's see how this is going to work. It, you can also prepare the maps. So now, it's, there's more and more maps coming up here. And it even calculated the watershed basins. So these are the basins. And it calculated the flow direction. But this one is, I think it's, this is the one without no sinks. Okay, so what happens if I go now and I do a channel network, but I use the one with no sinks, and I use all the other settings are the same, except I will also say create a new, uh, so no sinks also, I can say create a new, a new layer, so we can just compare channel network with things and without things. So let's do that. And we will put this thing with a different color. It is already a different color. And we'll put this one uh, size 2. And the first one I will put 
size 2 but I want to have it as a broken line dotted style okay so now this uh, no it has cousin be dotted something else dash uh, yeah something like this so this was the first one and now I put on top of uh, the same map number four I put the other ones and now we can compare and now you can see here I have the oh, let me zoom in somewhere where it's very visible yeah something like here maybe it's, it's difficult to see but uh, the dotted line is below uh, so maybe I will put this one on top top of the other so I put move down yeah so you see the, 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 the dotted line is the one without sinks so with sinks and then this other color which I actually have to change that color I will change it to what do I put yellow let's see how yellow works yeah so you see there's the dotted line and there's the full line full yellow line and the full yellow line goes through so it, it just goes through okay so so I'm kind of I'm I'm certain that this feeling of sinks is a good thing to do because um, this looks more uh, realistic so if the the water flows here it will just go like try to imagine it. I mean you have a water flow which if it was always the very slow waterfall and uh, slow amount of water then um, it might accumulate somewhere but the water one season can like flow rapidly the other season it's dry whatever but when it's a, a high water flow it will just find its way and it will break all this things and so that's why it's more realistic so this yellow line on the bottom is more realistic and it, you see it also continues flowing further um, you see this the, the two displays that are synchronized so if I if I zoom into two layers also my 3d uh, visualization will change you see my uh, yellow line because also these things are filled in in the plane I also predict where the water will flow in the plane because it looks for the small differences. And this is now much more realistic. Okay, so I go now and rerun everything. Okay? Thank you. Sure. Do, uh, do I go back from the uh, tin plate splines or just uh, hydrology? Hydrology. Okay. So I can turn this off. Um, now I, I can keep on creating these maps and don't get confused in R you will, on SagaGS you have lots of you can have lots of maps but it's not a problem uh, the most important thing is that I want to um, I want to remove some of these layers I created so let's see these layers I can say close them and now it asks me do you want to save them because if you don't save them you lose them I said no I don't want to save them so I'm back to having nothing. And also the line, I can say, well, sh close all the lines. And I said, no, don't save it. So we are back, we, I only have the points. And I have the DM created using tin plate splines. Okay. And now first thing we said, we want to fill the sinks. And then we want to calculate the hydrological network. So... Uh, to fill in the sinks, I go on the geoprocessing terrain analysis, and there's a selection pre-processing. It's uh, it's quite uh, there are quite some modules I told you in in Saga JS, and they keep on adding things. They're very excited. They see something in the literature, and they say, "Well, that's very cool. Let's implement it." And then they go and implement it. But maybe for you it will be a, a confusing because you will say, well, which one do I use? Which one do you use? 
Well, you're researchers, exactly. You look at the researcher, uh, the literature, look at the other literature, compare it, and say, well, this, is, this looks better for me. If you're a high-level researcher, that shouldn't take you too much time. You, you scan it quickly, and then, uh, you can also look at the citation statistics, whatever, and say, well, there's more people using this, and, or it's more used in the area where I work, and then say, I use that one. Also, you see what very smart thing about the documentation for Saga GS, because it's built by scientists for scientists. Most, most of the time, they would just point to uh, authors and a year, and say, well, let's see this one, okay. Authors and year, and you'll find the sink removal. So you, you search sink removal of field sinks by these two guys, which I assume they are from France, from 2001, and then you find it, and then you, you study it a bit. But I love this enthusiasm about the Saga GIS team, that they, they read the literature and they, they appreciate you know, people developing new methods and they, they, they read the methods and then they implement them. So co for comparison, if you do a slope, if you do a slope map, slope map you can calculate some, I don't know, 12 ways. And if you do it in ArcGIS, I think it's only one way. And in Saga GS, you can calculate it really with 12 ways, and there are differences, and you can even use a different uh, search radius and play with the, You can make your own filters, and so it gives you much more dimensions, yeah. And, and there's no documentation except for the, when you go to the morphometry, so this one, and you say, I want to calculate the slope aspect curvature. And then usually it will just say, here, pick the list, and it says the literature. And that's what also Olaf is asking, oh, well, the, how do you find out this? Book? What do you want? I mean, here, read the, read the paper. It's going to be more sim uh, simple than that. So if you read the paper, we implemented that. We read the paper, and we just implemented it. But you see how many methods you get? And I mean, you will think, OK, who cares? I just want a slow map. But for some decision making, actually the slope is the key. And there might be, uh, there are different accuracies of uh, estimating the slope, for example, for a transportation, for a water f flow, for different things. There are different accuracies and different methods will perform different way. Yeah, there's some, uh, when you calculate the slope in also in a smaller search radius and a bigger search radius, you will get different things. So they, they might have, a, these things have can have impact on the decision making. Okay, I'm back to the terrain analysis. So we do terrain analysis, pre-processing, and I use field sinks. There's a XXL or the standard one. So I use this one. Don't ask me, I'm not going to go into that. Why do I use this one? And it is, uh, for many uh, parallel methods in Saga GS, I cannot tell you objectively which one is more accurate, which is better. In some cases, there are methods which are more accurate for your applications, but that's also not the topic of this course. I mean, so you'll, you'll have to do some research there. Um, but in, in some cases, also, uh, things are just a uh, question of flavor. You know, you want it more like this or more like that. So they can be equally accurate, but different flavor. Uh, so now I say, this is my input. Oh, sorry. I want to create output. And I leave the, the default 0 0.1 is a, uh, so it says here, minimum slope gradient to preserve from cell to cell with the value of 0 sinks to fill up to the spill elevation. So, yeah, there's a, also another par parameter which you can play with and will have different effects. Yep? Okay, the question is if I can specify the name of the output file. Uh, so for the field uh, DM, I can either choose existing file, which is not a good idea because you replace the analytical heat shading or something, so in this case, first you do a, you just say, I want to create a new layer. And so the first thing it will uh, create a new layer. And now I see this, this is the one with no sinks. Now I can actually also change the name. So I just go to the, I select the layer and I go to the name. 
and I call it uh, DM DM30. But I have to do apply, and you see there's a new name here. Just in case something happens and then my computer crashes or something, it's also a good idea to right click on that and you say save as, and then I save it into my current directory, our course, and I say I save it with the same name. Now I have it, I have it with this name in my session and also on my machine. I have it with that name. Yes, question? Uh, so yes, you can also in Saga GS, uh, once you save it, it will also save the history. And you can see that uh, this layer has been derived from this input using these settings. And this history is also saved in the text file. So you can use that as a kind of a metadata. Uh, so you can, I think, here on the top, this, the, this is the, the M GRD, so that's kind of a meta metadata. This one I have to double click and I have to open it with some uh, WordPad or something and it will show me exactly exactly this, so that's the history, but it's in a kind of a, uh, it's a XML file and it shows the processing history. So when you share that file you can see actually how was it derived in which were the parameters used. So you can even see the projection system and hmm, all the things. Do you just save as um, operation there? Yeah, I do the right click and then I save as. Yes, all the layers are only in the memory and if your saga crashes, you might lose them. So it's a good when you say, okay, now I finished playing with it. I, this is the layer I'm going to use. Uh, you can save it. And you can also save the whole project. Yes, you can save the whole, you can also say, I want to save the project. And you say save project as. And so let's, let's call it uh, Hydro. And it will it will, uh, you say I want to save all objects, and so it will put everything here, except maybe this, uh, uh, the base plane approximation I don't need, and, and well, this one also I don't need. So these are really the units. So now it's a save as a project, so if I, if I load that project, it will load all the f f uh, files. Yes, it will remember which are the files connected to that project. Yeah, so the, the it's quite, you can customize it very nicely. Uh, Saga GI, so when you start, you say I'm working, you can work on several projects at the same time, and then you don't want, you don't want to open like 100 layers and, and overlay and stuff, and then you just save it as a project, and then if you open that project, you get everything back, back where you stopped. Yeah, I didn't want to save all of the layers. So they will be, if I close now session and I open the project, I won't have that layers. Okay, then you're yeah. Gone. yeah, but you can, if you want, you can save them. I mean, so that's mm -hmm. up to you. Because I, I uh, remember I wrote into uh, Saga GS, so I can also do uh, grid 30, uh, read GDAL. Now I do read GDAL, not write. GDAL and I say I want to read this uh, DM30 as that. Okay, so now I read it also in uh, R. So the things I calculated in Saga GS, I can read into R, no problem. And I can do SP plot. Um, so you can see that that's this DM. Now it's just uh, it's an ugly display and I, I'm not sure if I maybe lost the projection system. Let me check. 
yeah, so it lost the projection system, so that's a bit unfortunate. So then I have to, I have to uh, go back to my original projection system here. So that's my original, and I can also do that. I can plot that in uh, Google Earth. So that's something we will also be doing today and um, uh, the other days. And I can say, I even I even made this. I copied this legends from uh, Saga GIS to uh, my plot KML package. So if I do this thing. So this is a nice way I can check that the the DM is uh, correct. So I can see the DM also in Google Earth. Of course, Google Earth has a much stronger uh, 3D visualization engine, and it has all this Iconos uh, data. But it sees the same legend as the Saga GS. It's the same thing, except now I can really validate it. I can really see okay that was uh, that's where it should be. Yeah, I can really validate that. So I'm now like I'm looking in a, a Saga GS layer in, in Google Earth. It can quickly move from one to the other. And here you can also set up this transparency. Yeah, so when I look, transparency is good. That's how, you see, this is how my daily uh, work looks like. So I do R, Saga, Google Earth. And uh, that's my, as I said, that's my happy triangle because I don't see them. I don't think I'm missing much. You know, I can look at the data uh, in R as a, as a, as a commanding uh, structure and I can look at the actual numbers. Then I can look at it, I can do ge uh, geographical processing and, and look at it, the, the pixel values and things. And then I can also do a validation and say, okay, no, this is correct layer, it's exactly where it should be. Um, and uh, I can do interpretation then. And, and so let's, let's try to do this uh, thing with the, so we we uh, derived the uh, uh, we did a, a, a sync filling. Then we can do um, channel network. So on the terrain analysis channels, I take the first one. Terrain analysis channels channel network. Okay, and uh, then I go and say, okay, that's my DM30, the one that is the uh, fix for the sinks. And I do have to set the initiation grid, which can be a different layer. You can have an initiation grid, uh, which is, so for example, you can have, um, uh, you, can have a, uh, you can imagine that the terrain will erode a bit, so you can have an elevation which is a bit higher and so you can imagine that terrain will erode because of the hydrological processes. So it will try to adjust to that. And then I say, okay, minimum segment length is 20. So please put that on 20 so you get the same output as me. And in this case, we ignore the initiation grid, so we use the same map. So we say it's the same, we use the same map, so no difference. So it will, it will simplify the, the extraction of the uh, streams. Um, yeah, you can also, uh, you can specify for each pixel if it has a different flow direction than uh, the, the one that Saga will use. So it's kind of your pre predetermined flow direction. Uh, so imagine like this, if you have dams, if you have all this um, things which are predefined. So they are not only defined by shape. You can plug them in. So it will calculate the hydrological flow also. Um, uh, if you, so for example, if you have a dam, then you can say that the, the flow goes up to the dam, and then the, the f so you can change the flow direction. But you change it in a grid file. And then when it, when it does hydrological flow, it's not going to flow over the dam. 
to be honest with you, I'm not a hydrologist. I mean, the, the, this is all science, I mean, to do things like that. So what I'm trying to teach you here to, to automate it, so to understand how do I connect the two softwares, how do I code. But the actual details of the hydrological flow, I mean, I'm not, it's really not my science. I mean, I, I also like, I just play with things sometimes and then I see, okay, that looks good. And, and then I say, okay, that, that's the method we can use. But I have to also sit with a hydrologist and say, what do you think about this model? What do you think about how do we do that? So when you do a real project, then you will, you will have to have a hydrologist in a team to do something like this. Anyway, did you all get the channel network? So the channel network we can display over the uh, regional DM and then we get something like this. So this looks, I think, uh, looks uh, pretty okay. And I can also save that into a um, so I say save as and I save it into a shape file. Maybe I won't put any empty, uh, maybe I just call it um, uh, stream. So I have it as a shape file. Uh, so if I really want to do some validation, I will just go and, so I'm here stream read OGR and then I say stream and then I have to say also layer name stream it's a bit silly and so I read it here um, I'm not sure if I have the projection system again or if it's lost so I'll just I'm not going to open it I'll just uh, replace the projection system. Oops. And then I can do again plot KML on stream. And here are my streams also. So this is a bit more powerful in Google Earth because, um, you know, if you set up this if I set up here transparency, hmm, so it's not on my way and I can see, I can see all this effect of having a 30 meter resolution, right? I see the effects because the kind of the line goes like, tick, tick, tick. so that's because of the 30 meter resolution. And you, you can see, I think there is some stream here and it's quite close to it, but it goes uh, zigzag around it because of the 30 meter resolution. There also here, I think there's a, there's a stream here flowing, but then they stabilize it because they put a, a channel or something. Well, it's difficult to see. I know there's a stream running here, so we are not so far from it, but yeah, there's a bit of difference. This white thing are the roads, huh? they're not streams. The white things you see, they're roads. Are you able to get these uh, things into Google Earth or should I go? R codes. Sorry? R codes. R codes, yes, that's the key. Okay, I'll put this R codes now because we have to stop actually. We are 15 minutes over. So we have to stop. So I'll just leave this and then in the lunch we will continue.